Hello everyone, it's Richard Lewis here with another vlog from the Major, and uh, it's a little bit later in the day. I've had a bit of a lie-in today, it's about 8am uh, at the time of recording this, and um, a little bit, you know, starting to feel the schedule now, uh, all I've done for like <laughs> four days or something is kind of just be on air and or be asleep, I've existed in two states, you know, this is a little bit strange, and <clears throat> your immune system kind of takes a hammer in when when you're in that position. It's a little bit croaky. I'm going to try and take it easy today, uh, so I'm fresh for the Fox Theatre. But um, I'll be heading off out and doing some media stuff. Uh, that's probably something we don't really uh, talk about a lot, you know, media requirements. I've been like an interviewer uh, and a journalist, you know, for a long, long period of time. And, you know, it's interesting being on the other side of the fence. Whenever there's a big event now for, for Turner, I kind of have that trust of the company uh, to not say stupid things or marginally less stupid things than uh, maybe I used to. I don't know. Um, so I, I, I kind of get put in to do a lot of uh, interviews, you know, in the build-up to the major. I think I did like four or five in a single day, uh, sometimes with, you know, mainstream publications, sometimes with community publications. I got a bunch booked, um, and that, yeah, you, we, this is something that uh, kind of comes with the territory, and all of our talent, you know, that we hire, they make themselves available as well, so it's a good way to kind of hype up the finals, uh, and just engage with the community, but most important is obviously talking to the mainstream media, which every time there's a big event they kind of poke their heads out and they want to see what's going on, you know, and with varying degrees of positivity, I will say. I've been in a few positions where I've been asked some very leading questions, you know, and fortunately, because I've been a journalist, sometimes even asked leading questions myself, you know, because that's the, that's the game. Uh, I yeah, kind of know how to wriggle my way out of them and not take the bait. But, uh, you know, the standard stuff. Obviously, people still want to talk about this gambling issue. We saw an ESPN special recently, and the timing of which I thought was, you know, it's just a little bit like, meh. Like, you're late to the party. You weren't interested when it was happening. Just before the World Championships, you want to drop a special about how Counter-Strike is corrupting the youth. I mean, don't get me wrong. Because <clears throat> you know, that was the general thrust of the article. But don't get me wrong. I think timing, it could actually be fortuitous. We already went past a million viewers in the group stages. I don't know if that's been done before. It must have been. I think people would have made a much bigger deal if it was like some record or whatever. Uh, I don't know if we'll hit the viewing record, but but the fact that we're still hitting a million in group stage games across all streams, I think that puts to bed any of this bullshit about it being a dead game. And actually, to be doing that without skins gambling... That's a hell of an achievement. So all, all of the naysayers and, and doom prophets are just wrong. I mean, you just you're talking shit. There's no statistical basis for what you're saying. Um, but yeah, you know, I, and I, you know, I'm a bit bit weary of the gambling thing in terms of having to address it and go out there and, and kind of say, look, definitely some bad stuff happened, and mistakes were made, misjudgments were made. Uh, but that's not what Counter-Strike's about. It was never what it was about. That was something that was tagged on to something that was already fucking awesome, you know? Like, you don't, um, you don't kind of judge something by the additions, the bells and whistles. Like, look at the call, look at what it's really about. Uh, so that's a little bit weary. There's a lot of questions about gender in gaming as well right now, and, you know, I just don't engage with the identity politics stuff. Uh, my views on it are quite clear. That I think esports is open to all. I think people have varying ideas on the best way to approach that and to encourage diversity. But I think everyone's on the same page. That it's like we don't want tokenism. We do want genuine diversity. But esports is one of the most welcoming and diverse communities in, in my experience anyway. Like that's my standpoint on it. So yeah, you, you, you know, there's some people who kind of come in and, and, I, and I think they're less interested in kind of helping grow the scene and just more interested in some kind of headlines. But that, again, it comes to the territory. I'll, I'll never condemn uh, people for doing that. You know, like, it's, I think, I think that just comes to the territory now in modern journalism, you know. So, it, it's, uh, it's a lot more exciting when you get to meet 
like actual journalists who are genuinely interested. And that's happened a few times. That, you know, I've talked to journalists from like the LA Times and, and stuff, and there's people out there that are genuinely interested in esports, find it a fascinating subculture the same way I did, because, you know, that's the journey I took. I was somebody from outside of it. Um, I was a journalist, an aspiring writer, and I discovered this, and I wanted to get involved, and I stayed here. You know, so I, I think that'll happen. They're the more exciting interviews. That's what I like to do. So we've got a full media day today and a full rehearsal. Obviously, we've got lots lined up for the Fox Theatre. Uh, I don't know if this is a spoiler or if I'm supposed to say it, but fucking I'll say it. We've, we've actually got Emmy award-winning directors for this show. We're, we're bringing in... Um, there's a few people who... I don't know if they've worked on the regular league show, but there's a few people that are coming because it's a live show and we want to really um, make it amazing. So we've got some, you know, slight alterations and tinkering within the crew. We're obviously keeping all the existing E-League staff and everything, but I think um, there's a few people coming in to um, really make sure we do this awesome job. And I've seen Valve uh, around the, the studios. They've been kind of in a little room, um, not, not too far from, I think, the green room. And, you know, they seem to be very happy with the way things have been going so far, which is awesome. Um, super happy that they're happy. That's the most important thing, you know. When we when we got the major, it was a big, big uh, endorsement of what E League's been doing. You know, we uh, haven't been in the space as long as a lot of companies, and to get a major one year in to what we're doing, is pretty. As like I say, it's a fantastic endorsement. So definitely uh, happy about that, and yeah, I think everything's been going well. A few technical issues. I don't want to make excuses and say that's going to happen. Uh, we're, we are looking at making sure that definitely doesn't happen for the later stages. And just, but, but I think the one thing we have done is when there's been delays, I don't necessarily think it's shown on the broadcast. What's actually interesting is I've done, obviously, TV now, and I've done eSports events. When there's a delay in an eSports event uh, and you're filling... Right, and fillings when we just talk, you know, and you can tell. Oh, hang on, they said the game was about to go live for twenty minutes. We're talking about whether Config's a good player or not. Uh, that's when we're filling. I'm sure you, you know, I'm sure the more aware of you out there know when it's happening. Uh, but I've worked at mainstream esports events. Obviously, won't name names. But when we're filling, we we never talk about the. We never say there's an error, or rather, it's been drilled into me. Don't say there's a tech problem. Don't say we're getting DDoS. You know, <clears throat> don't mention it. Don't mention the bad stuff. We don't want that. We don't want that going out to the community. So don't say anything. Sit there, fill. Hopefully the game starts soon. That's the prevailing sentiment in, in mainstream esports events. Meanwhile, <clears throat> when we're doing E League, I get someone in my ear. Tell everyone at home we've got a tech error. Uh, all right, okay. So we do. We, we, we're really, really transparent. And the crazy thing is as well, I don't even think our fill sections are that long. Because what we do is they don't want us just static on a desk just talking, which is, the e again, the eSports norm. I actually quite like it. You know, I like to fucking talk. Um, but we get told, you know, we're going we're gonna to quickly go to a commercial break. We're going to find out what's happening. Then we're going to come back and we'll probably just run a feature. And I think the one area we've really done well in is that when we've had that downtime, those slight delays, and I say slight because I don't think... I think you put all the time together uh, for the delays. I think it's pretty small uh, in comparison to other events. I think what we've done a great job of is having content there. Yeah, some of it's reruns and, re and repeats and whatnot, but having like evergreen content, fresh content that can go out. You know, if you miss something on day one and there's a delay and we show it on day two, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing uh, for the purposes of the broadcast. So... Uh, yeah, I think I think we've done lots of stuff right. Uh, we've received a lot of positive feedback, so it's been enjoyable uh, so far. Even if it's been you know long days, tough days, yeah, you, know, you know how it is. Um, the the schedule can be quite punishing uh, for people on the desk because you have to be there and watch all the games and talk, and you start the show and you end the show. Commentators obviously can you know come and go, do their games. Go have a rest back at a hotel. So let's talk about uh, the what you really want to hear about, I, I imagine, which is the fucking matches yesterday. Which is what, yesterday was where predictions went to die. I, I think in my predictions, I think I got them all wrong. I, I think I actually went zero and six. Obviously, I couldn't predict the redraws, so there were nine games. 
Um, and I and I, I think I probably honestly making the snap predictions, just talking to Jason and Duncan. I think I probably fucking got them wrong as well. I think the Astralis Team Liquid one was an easy to call, but easy one to call. But I definitely had Optic. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever. Fuck it. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, so uh, let me just uh, bring up the first game, which was uh, G two versus North, and I had G two winning that one. Uh, now they definitely uh, kind of. I mean, it's hard to tell whether G two had a good draft here or not because. The remaining maps were new can overpass, and I think this has been one of the prevailing issues with with G two, is that when the randomizer has been there, it's like they've the the v, they don't have a deep enough map pool to not be reliant on the randomizer by the end. That's pretty much the situation they've been in, and I think every time there's been the randomizer, it's been the least favorable option for them. Uh, you know, I I, I don't I, I thought G two. Looked okay on Nuke when they played Virtus Pro. And I know they've played Overpass and had some good results on Overpass. I definitely think they're a better Overpass uh, team than a train team. That goes without saying. But I, I still wonder if maybe Nuke coming up might have been better here. I, you know, maybe not. I, I don't know. But uh, I did have G2 winning this one. And there was a, there's a lot of factors here as to why... I don't think they did. I mean, first of all, I I just feel they've been playing these maps where having a top tier sniper is vitally important and makes all the difference. Uh, I think overpass definitely counts as one of those, and I, I'm I'm gonna have to say it. I fuck you know I don't want to, but Smith just isn't good enough. He just isn't good enough. And it, it really told. There were numerous instances where he wasn't able to make important kills. And I, again, I keep saying it, your AWPA, it's too important a position to be underperforming. When you're like, oh, he's our AWPA and a support player. Right, okay. Well, you, you, you've hamstrung yourself. You're never going to be a top team. Sorry, it's not going to work. It's, it, it's a vitally important position. It's like saying, oh, we've got a quarterback, but he can't throw the ball. You know, what's the fucking point? You know, like, oh, great, well, I can hand it to the running back. What's the point? What's the fucking point in that? Get yourself a quarterback who can throw. So, I th you know, I've known Edward a long time. I, I, th I think this is his swan song based on the rumors, and he's going to move to coaching soon. I think he'll be very suited to coaching. Uh, a lot of uh, things that people don't know about him is he's a very conscientious guy. He actually does do a lot of looking after the team just naturally you know he's an older guy he's mature he's, he's uh, a lot you know a, f a fun guy never gets stressed never gets upset it's very rare you see see him kind of crack and, and lose his composure and i think he'd be well suited to coaching and certainly management and beyond and definitely wish him every success in that because eduardo as i said is a great guy i've known him a long long time and we definitely might differ on some of our views uh, when it comes to the game, but there's no disputing that he has all the attributes to being an incredible coach. Uh, but yeah, in, in this game, I thought it told a little bit. I, I don't think this was a polished North by any stretch of the imagination, but the, the key differences for me are everything I said about Rubino in my other vlogs uh, were just underlined here. I mean, th this guy, I think he's a sleeper pick for, for MVP in, in North... Um, Honestly, uh, Magic's yes, he'll get the statistics. Config has finally woke up and started doing the flamboyant stuff on day four and put, posting big numbers. Rubino's been solid. I mean, and, and as, as I keep saying, he's the guy who digs them out of the hole. When a round looks lost and the opponents have that uh, numerical advantage, it's Rubino that usually pops up with a, with a play, with a flash, with some clever utility or with some kills. And, and gets them back in the round. I mean, he is the middle of the round guy. He he is unbelievable at what he does. And yes, he, when 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 the unit is malfunctioning, Rubino is the guy who will most acutely feel it. You know, nobody has the expectation for MSL to post big numbers. Don't think that's ever going to happen. 
Uh, but uh, Rubino, sure, he has those bad games. That's when everyone comes out and says, you know, you should get yourself another Danish star, get Valde in. Like, fuck no, that that would be a clusterfuck. Like, I think Valde is an amazing player, going to have a big 2017. Rubino, though, is the fucking glue. I, like, you take away the fucking glue and put in another star player, this team's fucked. I mean, utterly fucked. So, yeah, uh, hopefully people are going to start giving him props. I've been saying that for like three months. You can go back on broadcasts and watch. Like, I understand very acutely what makes a good support player. And, and Rubino, for me, is kind of at that level now where a vintage Zipniks was. That's how highly I rate him. Uh, I don't know if people agree or feel the same way. But uh, I, hopefully people are starting to become converts. So over at G2, Shocks uh, definitely uh, performed well. Looking forward to seeing him in this French shuffle. I think he's getting back to his best. RPK really surprised me. Thought he had a great tournament. Looks like he will be missed out in the French shuffle. Very interesting to see what will happen to him. Because this is a player who's already retired once. He is getting old. In Counter-Strike terms. And I, I think there's still some juice in the tank. If he can play like this, he'll go do a job for somebody. Now, one of the famous things is RPK needs to be micromanaged. Uh, but we'll we'll see. I think a strong in-game leader. I mean, if, if, if we take the constituent parts of what's left over from the French Shuffle, I think you can still make a very functional team. Uh, happy RPK, you know, that that's a pairing that I could maybe see working. Uh, if they can get along. I mean, again, you never know with... French personalities. I thought Body has been good. I, I think this has really established him as a top tier French player, uh, as if people didn't know. But there's just too many weaknesses. And, and, and I've talked about Smiths. I won't labor the point. Smiths was the statistically worst player at this major, below Spiddy. So let that sink in. Okay. There's no justification for this anymore, guys. I, I know it's not nice to stick the boot in, but that is just the fact of the matter. And you're going to have to wake up to that fact. You've got to stop judging people's performances based on feelings and based on whether they're nice guys or not. The reality is he has been beyond subpar. And unfortunately, there's no forgiveness in Counter-Strike at, at the elite level. There just isn't. With that in mind, Scream, I, what the fuck? Like, you know, what the fuck? I guess this whole French shuffle thing has really got to him because he looked distracted. I've always thought Scream was an emotive player anyway. When he's feeling the game, his aim is incredible. When he's motivated, happy, everyone's high-fiving. He always seems to be better uh, than he is. I've never really liked this style of play that he has because I think it looks good, but I don't think it is optimal. I don't think it's effective. I think when you are going for one-taps, at range uh great you know having that ability to do that is phenomenal one bullet aim is in itself a talent when it comes to holding down bomb sites and you're getting rushed and getting flashed and you're still peeking and going for the one taps at mid to close range uh you're going to get wrecked every time by somebody who sprays that is the nature of cs and uh, or, you know provided they can actually do it and, and recall control and you know, I've always been critical of that. I, I, I think he's, I've said, Scream for me is an entry fragger that doesn't like to entry frag. And when he's played more entry roles for G2, that's when they've been at their most effective, in my opinion. When he's been the number one guy, the first guy out, he can open up a bomb site. If he makes aggressive plays on the CT, he's good enough to get a quick peek and get a kill out of it and then fall back and, and you can play out the rest of the round. He can be a great disruptor. But certainly just in terms of being consistent, nah. And I know people are going to be like, you've always been saying this about Scream and he's proved it wrong, he's been statistically great and you're just judging it on the major. Well, all right, okay, let's just judge it on the major. He he was poor. I mean, he didn't really turn up. Um, and certainly not in this game, which is when you need him. You need Scream in a game to take on Config and Magic. So even though I had G2 winning, I think the combination of things are, you know, conspired to fuck up that prediction so then we go over to fanatic and envious had envious obviously because i got all my predictions wrong i'll, I'll keep laboring that i own it because I, I say predictions don't mean shit i mean they really don't if, if you find me one person like it was like oh i had all of these predictions correct from from that day 
I would say, well, look, again, what this fucking wonder dog shit proves is that you can just throw a fucking dart in a board and be right more often than somebody that thinks and theorizes and takes all the evidence into account. Because obviously, if 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 upsets never happened, predictions would be easy. And upsets do happen. And there's so many factors in something like Counter-Strike. All of my predictions were made blind before the maps were in. You know, there's, there's lots going on. So I don't give a fuck. All the people who say, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, well, okay. I mean, I do, but predictions wouldn't be a measurement of that. And I always point to Artosis, one of the most knowledgeable StarCraft uh, analysts that there's ever been, very rarely got his predictions right. I mean, it was called the Artosis Curse. So uh, there you have it. Uh, anyway, so Fnatic, uh, Envious. Strange one this was, you know, goes to Cobblestone. Uh, which was when Cash was left, I think Cash might have been the slightly better game because I feel I'd envious and moved away from Cobblestone. But let's let's talk about just the Fnatic performance. Twist's first big performance, Olaf Meister steady away, Krim steady away. And, you know, Disco and Dennis, even level pegging. Uh, very sort of strange to see Envious have like this pretty... Uh, decent t side and still lose you know like they, they they got their rounds apex on fire looking great uh it's just a bit strange t to me to sort of see them drop off and and kenny s i think he had a good tournament overall uh but yeah this fanatic game was a bit of an aberration for me and and for fanatic to win it and win it in the style that they did it was fairly comprehensive it was 16 11 i think it does show that the core talent of fanatic uh, is is going to be potentially good because I mean over at Godsent, Flush is still k killing it, and if JW is the one that's going to come back, he's the only question mark in that team. Everyone else is actually at a good level of form, and if they can get past all their personal differences, Fnatic could be great again. But I was disappointed in this, and I think this is kind of typified the envious story that NBK has fluctuated. When he's been good, he's been very good. When he's been ineffective it's it's told apex has been fucking great i like i can't wait for this french shuffle now because if everybody takes the form um it's the side that's been reported right if everybody takes the form they're in now that's gonna challenge to be a top three team in the world you know that's if everybody plays at the level they're at now individually in that team they're gonna be quite a fucking uh shock to a lot of the established teams right now but it's it's kind of the same old story. You know, Sixer, he's not there to frag. He's kind of been put into, like, Duncan talked about it on the broadcast, so I won't labor the point. But when you are that fifth wheel, when you are the guy that gets the unpopular positions, doesn't get to play to their strengths, everyone else is made to look good, it's just hard. You're just there. All you have to do is kind of frag, and, and, and sometimes you're not even getting to do that because you're out of position, you're rotating, you're not comfortable, you're picking up even different weapons, you're dropping for other people. It kind of sucks. But... Sure, I, I think in this game he probably wasn't good enough. Um, and there's constant question marks about it. I mean, ultimately, it's not going to matter. Because I, I, one thing I do think is six year all I mean, He'll end up playing with fucking Devil, you know, and those guys probably or something. You know, he's not going to be in a, in a tier one French team uh, after Envious. So congratulations to Fnatic. You know, obviously secure legendary spot. Quite an achievement with all the problems they've got. Uh, then the next game was the dumpster fire, you know, Liquid versus Mouse Sports. Fuck me, I had no idea how bad Mouse Sports were. I mean, Liquid are bad, right? I mean, Liquid are unbelievably bad. But uh, Mouse Sports and just next level garbage. Um, and, and well, I mean, shit. This is a team that has basically got talent on the roster. You know, I don't even think necessarily... You know, I, I don't. I don't think necessarily. You know, guys like Dennis, for example, are all uh, that bad, right? Like, I don't think they're that bad. Uh, yes, I think overall last year, I think he might have even been statistically worse than Spitty. But right now, in the here and now, don't think uh, he's that bad. But it goes to Nuke. Mouse Sports have been kind of cock teasing this whole Nuke thing. That yeah, 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 we're gonna uh, we're gonna play Nuke. We're gonna leave it in the vetoes if it comes up. So you think you must have a plan? You must have a fucking plan. Well, you, they don't have a fucking plan. They literally don't. 
Um, you know, they've got um, yeah, definitely ignoring that. Media, that probably is a media request there. Uh, so, um, you know, they've um, they don't have a plan. They didn't have a plan for Nuke at all. They literally left it in and didn't know how to play it. I mean, what the fuck are you doing? Uh, you know, where this team needs a coach, it needs a leader, it needs something, you know. And let's just talk about individual levels of performance. Like, first of all, they don't know what they're doing, but Nico and Chris. Made it competitive. Lowell and Dennis, sure, middle of the pack. Spitty, come on, dude. This is fucking out of control now, mate. There's, I saw a lot of people saying, oh, Spitty's... Because he was upset at the end and clearly emotional. And everyone was like, oh, Spitty, you know, blah, blah, just put in a bad position by the V up. One for 19. Guys, there's, these performances are indefensible. They are indefensible. You cannot come up with some crazy insane reverse mirrored logic about how he's not his fault let's say this map was on let's say this game was played on militia right you as a professional level player should be able to run around the map not knowing what you're doing and probably win about you know high a high amount of jewels if you like you should still be able to do damage 26 ADR, and in I said already. I think when he, in his two for seventeen game, he had twenty two ADR. You're not even doing damage. You're not even doing the damage for your teammates. What are you contributing? There is no excuse for this kind of performance. And I, I've I've said it often. I, I you know I think uh, Mouse Sports is former manager. The guy who's with Big Now, Psycho, as he's called, he's had a go. He's had a pop at me saying, you know, you need all different kinds of players to make a great team. Yeah, you're right, but you don't need bad players to make a great team. And if you want to spin it that there's some way this can happen in Counter Strike, it's not a fucking NFL franchise. You don't have forty fucking fifty players and eighty players in the squad. You know, if you can spin it to me that somehow Spitty is doing something that no other player in the world could do in that lineup. I will accept it, but it's bullshit. You're just coming out and defending somebody that you know deep down in your heart of hearts sucks and isn't good enough on the basis that he's in the system, he's under contract, you like him, uh, you know, whatever. And, you know, and I understand that you need difference in role players. I've just been singing Rubino's praises and saying he's actually instrumental in North's success. It's not that I'm fucking all about, ah, frags mean everything. I think Nico can sometimes be quite a destructive force in mouse sports, honestly. I think his attitude fucking stinks. But that said, uh, this this is... I mean, they were never going to win anyway because they're running around like a bunch of headless chickens. But Jesus Christ, give yourself a fighting chance by able to fucking shoot. You know, like it's a fundamental part of the game. I'm sick of hearing these excuses about like players who just play bad and everyone goes, oh, they're support players. No, they are bad players, and you are giving them the label support players, which is an insult to people who genuinely support their team. Uh, to try and excuse it, to try and deflect criticism. So he was abysmal. And absolutely should feel bad. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry that it's harsh. He should feel bad. This is a major. Mouse sports are a very story team. And you're instrumental in why they're failing. Yes, you should feel bad. Uh, meanwhile, Liquid, again, I don't think they had to do anything special here. The Liege puts in another functional game. Great stuff. Pimp's been waking up a little bit here. But it, it just wasn't spectacular. They, all they had to do was just out-aim mouse sports uh, and, and kind of get their timings right and get their tactics right, which they do because this is a pocket pick. For Liquid, this is the one map they've looked like an actual functional team on. So again, it's the fucking terrible veto from Mouse Sports and, and not really sad to see them go. I think Mouse Sports need to really have a long, hard think about what they're going to do as a team. For Problem number one they need to fix. They need a coach, leader, a, a disciplinarian. They're still banging the tables and arguing with each other. You saw it at the end of the game, you know, it's too emotive, it's too highly strung. That, that's all well and good when you're winning games. Creative tension, but yeah, not good enough. So you have Godsent versus Optic. Obviously picked Optic. I think most people did. Uh, but wow, like what a fucking performance by Godsent. And they remain the most frustrating team. Probably is in World Counter-Strike right now. You want to predict what they're going to do? You can't. You want to uh, predict who's going to play well outside of Flusher? Maybe not. It... Uh, you, Sometimes Pronax looks average. Sometimes he looks 
awful. Sometimes I, I couldn't even tell you outside a train what their best maps are. What the fuck is going on at Godsend? It's 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 like it's like just taking a hit of fucking DMT trying to fucking predict what they're gonna do. It's 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 insane. And you know, again, they they uh, got the cash pick. Optic very strange. Like Optic got maps here, by the way, that they could perform on. They had their train. They had cash. These are the maps that they perform on, and they failed. So you've got to, first of all, say Optic weren't good enough because Optic, the Optic that won E-League Season 2 and made it to the finals at ECS would have beat teams like this. What they haven't probably spanked on is just Lecro. I mean, shit, this is a breakout, in my opinion. Lecro was good. I remember when I did a video about Godsent, back when I was saying they should be the best team in Sweden on, on paper. Uh, and I was saying that, for me, Lecro is a bit of a uh, middle-of-the-pack player. I don't think he's en doing anything spectacular. Well, actually, this guy has been a revelation at this major and, and, a, and a very happy surprise. Uh, he has... Like, the, the things that he brings to the team, it's not just necessarily about fragging, which I think, obviously, he, he does particularly well, but it's the types of frags he gets. For example, you can see it yourself. You don't need to be a high-level analyst on particularly have a deep understanding of Counter-Strike to realize it. This is a guy who, on the pistol rounds, will, will pick up a deagle, and he'll put it to work. He'll get kills with it. And not just, you know, a kill at the end when he's baiting his team or whatever. I'm talking about actual impact kills. He can open up a bomb site with a deagle. He can take guns away at the end of a round when they try and hunt him down for whatever reason with a deagle. He's had some hugely impactful match not not much winning, but certainly momentum shifting rounds with pistols alone. That's worth its weight in gold. And when you think about some of the players that Optic have had, you know, think about Stanislaw and how effective he used to be with pistols. They should really understand. I mean, they will definitely have an understanding of why this is a a, a huge boon to have in your team. The fact that he's now you know doing it with rifles and everything else and really looks accomplished and is kind of like that second guy into the site, like on mop up duty been really enjoying it and when you when you when you add it to what flusher can do still one of the best clutch players in world counter-strike uh jw's been hit and miss but in this game was was a hit schneider hit and miss landed in this game this is this is why god center inconsistent because ultimately <laughs> I, this sounds like such a stupid observation hear me out the bedrock of their team is is almost inconsistency uh, Flusher and Lecro now are, are, are consistent, but there's too many dependent parts. Like, if J JW is a notoriously inconsistent player because of his play style, he's aggressive. He peaks and and we all and, and makes and tries to make crazy plays. We all know they don't come off. Like, you can play solid, steady, pick here, pick one. JW is never going to do that. He he's not that kind of player. Never going to have the discipline. So if JW goes off and all of those shots land and all of his decisions happen to be the right one. Cosmically, at that particular, at that time, Godsend are going to be good. Pronax is uh, again; he is just in terms of aim, not good enough. Uh, in terms of fragging, not good enough. In in terms of uh, almost everything to do with the actual mechanics of the game, he's not good enough. Uh, I don't I haven't seen anything tactically to make me think that they couldn't get a better choice of in-game leader. And I, I'm sorry to say this about Marcus because I think he's one of the great in-game leaders you know but uh god god sent they suffer because if an inconsistent play by jw fails and then schneider tries to make a, a play as well and that fails now you've got Le let's say you've got lecro flusher and pronax at the end of a round in a three on three well you can't bank on pronax so you're immediately at a disadvantage once pronax is out and you're in that position where the numerical advantage is against you you get pushed you get pulled you get picked apart these are where the failings are, and unfortunately, Pronax has to understand now in this day and age that uh, there's, there's, it's inexcusable to be one of the statistically worst pros uh, if you want to be a high-level player, and it's it's definitely not going to work in a team where you have inconsistent players uh, who, who have this uh, flamboyant and erratic play style. 
But that said, they made mincemeat of Optic. Optic go out. Uh, you know, I, I thought Rush had a great uh, major. I think he was let down a little bit by some of the other guys who weren't bad but were inconsistent. Maybe this was just a bit of pressure. Maybe it was bad luck. I mean, they did play a lot of good teams. So I, I will say that. But, you know, if you get your maps, uh, I, I think Optic probably should have made it. Uh, to the legends spot actually so a bit disappointed be interested to get their thoughts on it i'll probably have a chat with them at some point you know talk to Tarek or stan or, or rush and just pick their brains because they're really cool guys and i wish them all the best and i think they'll bounce back i, I don't think this is the end of optic by any means i still think they're going to be a world force but yeah i i think they can only really blame themselves in this and uh, it'd be a little bit disingenuous to suggest they got unlucky because they had good luck with the vetoes and good luck with the, and, and good luck with some of the teams they played after the initial Astralis and VP stuff. Astralis SK, wow, what a fucking match! One of the matches in the major, uh, huge, hugely enjoyable. Uh, what what can you really say about this other than uh, you know it was uh, just back and forth, showed all of Astralis's strengths. Uh, device again, monster performance from him. I keep saying it about Glaive, the game of his life. Yeah, he's actually really, really good at fragging. People need to realize this. Cold Zero, an absolute animal, just tearing people apart. 35 kills again, Fur 29. When these guys go off, uh, you, you, you're you going to really struggle to put SK to bed. I mean, they're, they're too good, you know? They're just like ridiculously good. And. Uh, even though Fallen's had a quiet major by his ridiculously high standards, what was good about this game is SK looked like a unit. Fox was performing. Taco was performing. Everybody was performing on the individual level that they needed to. And what's crazy is this was a Dust2 game. Astralis should have been clear favourites for this. Fuck all the standing bullshit. SK Gaming, this is a middle-of-the-pack map for them. Yes, they can win games on it. They can beat North American teams on it. whoop de fucking do Astralis, the Danes, they were one of the irresistible forces on Dust 2, if you go back like 18 months. They, they were a team that would just run over fucking teams on this map. Well, didn't happen here, and, and SK's fortitude uh, was, was something to behold. So just a, a fantastic story here. Astralis did get there in the end, obviously, as we know. Spoiler alert. But uh, SK Gaming, I thought, this was the definitive performance. This is the best performance here. Not just because of the nature of the team that they beat, but because of the nature of everybody started to perform. And if they take that level into uh, their games, I think uh, moving forward, I think it's fucking good news. I, I think it's a good time to be an SK fan. They could really do the unthinkable and do three in a row. I Caveat, I don't think they will, but... If everybody performs to this level, if, uh, if if they can finally find that place for Fox, which they did very much so in, in this map, and um, a, lot of, a lot of you in the comments made the point fall and you didn't really drop the AWP in the game lost in Na'Vi. I went back, had a look. Yeah, you were right. Um, I still feel they're giving Fox kind of positions that maybe fallen and, and other player and taco might want to kind of fill in for sort of definitely made an adjustment to accommodate him rather than giving him what's left over but but as i said i i, I feel if if this if this is the future if this is what it looks like for sk could be a deep run i mean it, it would be a hell of a story sk gaming write those on a daily basis so next up obviously we had i'm trying to speed up a little bit actually because uh, i've already taken too long uh, gambit versus phase and uh, we had i had phase for this one kind of stand by that saw some insane uh retarded hate threads why do you hate gambit i definitely don't hate gambit um i, I feel that uh the you know the good the great story about this is since zeus joined and adrin uh gets to be uh, a little less cerebral and they've been given a a, a difference a different approach uh you know to what they were doing under hooch you know everyone's kind of stepped up a little bit still think mo's a little bit too inconsistent for me and hobbit you know by by every measure has had an inconsistent major as you'd expect young player breaking through first major but adrian holy fucking shit and if you go back and you look at his land performances i mean he's actually always been good at land i mean that's the benefit of experience but this is like a next level this is like a jump above and basically he was the difference maker you know 34 kills uh just monster numbers across the board 124 adr so many clutch rounds and in a 16 14 game even one clutch round as you know is is vitally important and you know phase 
this isn't a bad defeat by any stretch of the imagination. It was another close game. I, I think FaZe's margin for failure is, is decreasing. Uh, I think what, what's been happening with Carrigan being able to frag and feeling confident to kind of put, put it on him and not rely on his star so much. It's very interesting. Uh, Alu remains resurgent. Definitely a, a top opera in Europe right now on, on current form. And, yeah, I, I think, actually, I might want to see just a little bit more from Rain and, and AZ. Uh, just a little bit more. Just, like, a, an extra 1%. And I think that's going to put FaZe over the top and make them a top-tier team. Because, make no mistake, Gambit are fucking good. <laughs> Gambit are a really good side. Uh, and definitely deserve to be in the legendary spot. I'm, I'm super happy for them. I think they've developed young talent. I, I, I think, uh, yeah, you know, with, with Hobbit and everything and, and the experience of Zeus and Adrian and Dozier, this is fucking, this is really exciting to see. I think, I, I made this point, I think we've got so many good young players coming through. You look over at Flipside, we're like Electronic and, and there's a few other names. Uh, you know, think about the Chopper at Vegas Squadron and stuff. This could be like the, the emergence of a new CIS kind of era for, for Counter-Strike. Kind of like what we saw back in the past. Um... When I think it was DNS and, and you know, obviously Na'Vi and uh, other fucking teams whose names escaped me from back in the ether of 1.6. You know, you had all these good players. You had all these good players from Russia, the Ukraine, Kazakhstan. And they were all just making these mixed teams and fucking people up and creating upsets at 1.6 events. Wouldn't it be great to have that again in, in CSGO? All the indicators are there that 2017 could be a really good year for the CIS region in, in Counter-Strike. And Gambit are going to be that flagship, you know? Gambit and Na'Vi, right? That'd be fucking great. Oh, and just as a point, Zeus being in Gambit, if they can win, if they can win, a Na'Vi can win, and they got in that collision, that's got to happen. Like, I don't even care if they have to rig it, rig it, fuck it. Like, that's the story, right? I want to see that as uh, as a CS fan. I want to see the return of Zeus. That's just, uh, what, a, what an emotional game that would be. So, uh, after that happened, there was the redraws. Uh, North God sent, what a fucking game, shout out to Config for that one HP knife, I mean, it's so stupid, if I was the manager of the team, if I was the coach, I would be reading him the riot act, I literally would, I'd be like, you never do that again, you know, and it's fucked up because it's a great moment, it's a great moment in Counter-Strike, uh, everyone's gonna remember that, it's in line, I think it could get a graffiti, honestly, I think it's that fucking good. Uh, and, and just balls of steel. I've never seen anyone be that composed in that situation. And for a young player to do that, holy shit. But you could see from the reaction of his teammates, like, Cajun's like, what are you fucking doing, mate? If he turns around and fucking just puts one bullet in your body, you know, he could even shoot you in the big toe and you are dead. And you are doing this in a major where we're fighting for our tournament life. It's not fucking cool, you know? So, definitely, like, just... Really, you know, North didn't impress me overall. Uh, as I said, MSL and Pronax, like, just going at it. I made the joke on the broadcast, if this had been settled by a 1v1 between the two of them, no fucker would have died. We'd still be here. We'd still be doing it. So, they definitely need to work on their own individual level of performances. I don't accept the excuse that being an in-game leader reduces you to this level. But also, just pointing this out... God sent were in the ascendancy. You know, Lecro was going off. JW was going off. Flusher was going off. The, you know, this was happening. All of the parts in God sent were firing. The, JW's last two games were really, really good. Flusher made so many clutches again. Like, he... It, it makes you go back. We all know about the clips and everything. It does make you go back and wonder, though, like, just how smart this fucker actually is. And, uh... I'm not going to wind back anything I've ever said, but this dude fucking is one of the most intelligent players I think Counter-Strike's ever produced. Uh, but Rabino in this game, like, he's dug them through again. Like, I don't think North are going to particularly... Like, I, Anders is living in some fucking fantasy land where it's like a North Australis final or something. <clears throat> but... Um, yeah, I don't, um, you know, I, 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 I don't, they've not impressed me. I mean, they've, they've been winning ugly, I suppose. That's good. But fuck me, Rabino, what a legend. You know, what a fucking legend this guy is. Just to, go, go back and watch how he plays this game. Watch how many times a round is lost and he gets two kills, three, and you, they're back in it. And he does it through clever positioning. He does it through clever use of flag. Just go and watch it. It's, I would actually like, um, I know some people watch my stuff. There's a, there's a CSGO demo review guy. 
I, obviously, I know for a lot of stuff you do, you're looking at Overwatch stuff. Just somebody put a video together of Rubino's performance on this and break it down and, and show everything he does right. I'd do it myself, but no one would take it credibly. Yanko, somebody, please do this. This is an instrument. This is the archetypal support player performance. This is fucking great. So, Godson in the last two games show some promise. Uh, but, yeah, they, they made a rod for the back. They lost some games in this they shouldn't have. And... Um, no, that's the end of that team, pretty much. I'm, I'm a believer in the Swedish shuffle. Faze envious. Faze uh, too good in the end. Kenny S back to the Titan days of Elo Hell. And very impressed with this. Again, it's on Nuke. I think we can safely say now Faze uh, can do Nuke very well. And Envious, in the end, at the end of the day, they they can't. And um, it's interesting because way back, way way back, the French really innovated how to play Nuke uh, in other iterations of the game, but not in this one. And uh, you know, you want to talk about all the same stuff. Real happy for Kiyoshima. Obviously, you, me, me and Kiyoshima are pretty tight, and he's he's a really good. You know, he's he's a fucking funny dude. Um, thought it was great what Smick said on the broadcast. He's gone from being a problem to the solution. Obviously. Carrigan brought him in to be this role player. There were great consistency across the board for all of Faze. But again, Alu just was what gave him that extra edge, that extra firepower. For all of Kenny S, you know, doing what he did. Apex wasn't really able to get his entries going in, in this. I feel uh, maybe Nuke isn't a, a map that he feels comfortable on. I, I thought MBK was okay. Happy with that Ultra Lurk. Definitely did have an impact in some rounds, but less in others. That's the nature of the beast. Kenny S, fucking so good. And, and Sixer, again, just looked out of sorts, you know, just didn't really uh, look to have the focus on the understanding of the map and, and yeah, kind of was adrift. So, yeah, I mean, not much to say about it. FaZe will be looking forward to being in the Legends. Envious is done. And that's that. And then the f last match, again, because I'm pressed for time, um, Astralis Liquid. Fuck me, Liquid. Wow. Just, you've got to be ashamed. You know, like, to to play this poorly. It's not even like, okay, you should be losing this all day. When you're just letting device... I don't even know what it was. It was some fucking insane fucking stat he had. Like, some insane, uh, you know, kills per death. When you are just letting a elite-level player style on you and nobody can do anything about it, it's just embarrassing, you know? 29 for 6, 149 ADR, 2.32 HLTV rating. And meanwhile, even Elise was quiet in this game. You know, who's going to step up and take the game by the scruff of the neck for Liquid? Who's going to say, guys, we fucking got this? And I watched them shut down while this was happening. So, not a great draft. They used to be good at Mirage. You know, they don't play it so much these days. But where was the communication? Where was the talk? Where was the motivation? Nobody was talking. Nobody was doing anything. I, I've said this for a while. There's, there's internal issues in Liquid. You need. You know, I feel sorry for guys like JDM who are positive. You know, who who do want to... Uh, Hiko too. Guys who want to talk it out. Be like, come on, let's win. We can do this. You know, blah, blah, blah. When, when you're losing round after round after round and nobody's talking, you all know that's the death of a team right there. You all know that is the fucking... That's what... You know, that's proof that they're going to lose games. So... I was I was just embarrassed for Liquid, honestly, at, at, at this. It showed the gulf in class, but it also just showed how motivation uh, has kind of gone from the, the Liquid project. Nobody's going to take ownership. Nobody's going to take responsibility. Nobody's going to step up and be a leader for that team. And for all of Elysius' strengths as a, as a phenomenal talent, he ain't a leader. That's the one thing he doesn't have. That's why, again, if you were to give me a choice and you were to say, hey, do you want to take Stewie 2K or you want to take fucking Elite? I, I go with Stewie 2K all, all, every day of the week. I feel mentality-wise, I feel he's a much better pick. Um, and, and that isn't to say he's perfect or flawless in that department, but but I, I think his story over the course of 2016 shows you this kid, that kid is, is what you want. That's what NA Counter-Strike needs more of. Uh, Elise is phenomenally talented, but, you know, it, where's the mental fortitude, you know? Whatever, fuck it. Uh, you know, the game was um, so unbelievably one-sided, embarrassingly so. Hard to believe this was a decider, you know, to see who gets a legend spot. It looked like a fucking qualifier game. Um, and, you know, Liquid go out. Back to the drawing board for them. Pretty sure we'll see some roster changes incoming because 
They bring in Zeus. They didn't look to have a, a strong veto. They didn't look to have any particularly strong tactics. I don't know if that's an indictment of Zeus or whether the players were on board with what they wanted to do. I, once the game starts, I mean, players can just say, Haha, we're not going to listen. You know, so it's very hard to judge the impact of a coach, but certainly you can say he's had no impact at all, uh, not through want of trying. But yeah, over, Astralis through. So let's get into the games that we're going to see tomorrow. Uh, Navi Astralis, I'm fucking so annoyed. I'm so irritated by this because Astralis shit in the bed uh, to get this far has set Navi and Astralis. This should be a final, right? Navi being my pick, Astralis being Duncan's and everyone else's, does irritate me. We're going to have this in the quarterfinals and it would look like Navi never had a chance. Let's be clear Navi can beat every other team. Astralis is the only outlier for me. That said, uh, I know Na'Vi uh, are feeling this is their time. They're feeling refreshed from the boot camp. I did see Astralis really struggling. And keep in mind, probably the team that wins this could be the winner over all of the major. There's a couple of outliers based on matchups, but certainly I, I, they, they would be the strong favorite. So... I'm going to stick to my pick of Na'Vi. I, I never dial back my picks. You know, I think a lot about them. I, I thought always thought Na'Vi could go on to be the best team in the world. I think, But it's interesting, isn't it? The two best teams never to win a major meet each other in the quarterfinals. Someone's going to continue that dubious legacy. I hope it's going to be Astralis. I don't mean that in a bad way. I just want to be right with my picks. But it's going to be interesting to see what happens mindset-wise. Because Na'Vi, people forget this. We talk about world chokers. We talk about Liquid. We talk about Astralis. Do you remember Na'Vi? They fucking choked a bunch as well. You remember how they would get to finals and they would be runners-up and they would do strange drafts and they would lose tournaments that looked like they were favorites to win? People just forget that. People have just erased that from their fucking brains. And there's numerous examples of this. And that's not to mention the fucking capitulation uh, that happened in the... Um, in, in in at the major in ohio at the start of the year so yeah pretty fucked up uh that this is the the quarterfinal but then again pretty fucking amazing that this is the quarterfinal so uh, super super psyched for that game first one as well in the fox theater talk about starting strong then you have Fnatic versus gambit wow what a fucking game this is now I'm, I'm probably going to throw the curveball in here and I'm going to go for Gambit. And you're going to be like, well, that's that that's that over. The first time you back Gambit, they're destined to lose. But why, why would I pick Gambit over Fnatic? Well, let me tell you. I, first of all, I think the just relief of getting to the legend spot, which is all Fnatic really wanted to achieve. The fact they definitely got a roster change coming and everything else. Um, you know, I think that's going to make individual... You know, all the, the, the players that know they're out feel that their obligation is done. We got you your legend spot, right? Don't ask too much more of me. And sure, the core are going to want to go far. It's all about prize money now and playing for pride. But Gambit are in another mindset. This is Gambit's time to build a fucking legacy. This is Gambit's time to uh, have that run in, in, in the tournament. That was unthinkable. Maybe three months ago, this is this is the time to really, you know, fly that flag for CIS, uh, Counter Strike, and, and show that they've arrived. And and honestly, I think they're gonna fucking do it. I, I think this could be like, yeah, sure, a two one at uh, a Gambit, close games. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go double down and go for Gambit here. I, I think I think there's something happening at this major um, that we're gonna look back on and, and have a better understanding to contextualize it. But I just feel as well. The problems in Fnatic, they're always going to be competitive on maps. I think Gambit might have the stronger map pool, honestly. I think uh, I think there's some shared maps that I would give a slight edge to Gambit on. So it's going to be interesting to see. If, but I think if Gambit veto correctly, get the series that they want, I think I think they win. I think they I think Fnatic can definitely take a map, but I mean I think Fnatic can, uh, Gambit are going to edge it over Fnatic. Then you got Virtus Pro versus North. It's over for North. It's over for North. Uh, there's no way they're beating Virtus Pro. Uh, there's just two, uh, Virtus Pro, like, here's the thing, they've played these games, they've beaten some really, really solid teams, uh, and Neo hasn't had to show up yet, and Bialy hasn't had to show up yet, so, it, it's been Snacks and Taz, pretty much, you know, so, head for the fucking hills, because North are gonna get blown the fuck out, uh, there's just no doubt in my mind, I think, I think everyone's been really overestimating North, and they're gonna be like, yeah, majors, yeah, woo, woo, M MSL, like I say, is an idiosyncratic in-game leader, and Virtus Pro are just going to pick them apart, turn the screw, apply that psychological pressure. Virtus Pro has the deepest map pool of any team 
at the major. Uh, they're gonna they, and they can exploit where, anywhere where North want to go, wherever North want to go in terms of their best maps. Uh, there's there's no doubt for me that Virtus Pro can beat them. So yeah, I think Virtus Pro comfortable, and then obviously Phase versus SK. Uh, brrr, good lord. You know, the crazy thing with this is, because they've already played, FaZe having played SK, and they should have won that game, and they lose in overtime, I really don't know. I, I feel this is too close to call. Because SK beating Astralis, yes, that is that is a huge result for them. But I still think, in a best of three, you would have to back the team that doesn't have a stand-in and a team with a great in-game leader, which obviously they both have. Uh, and, a, you know... SK do have the better players. I ah oh god, this is tough. This is really tough. You know, my, my head is screaming pick SK, it's a safe pick. I'll I'll fly contrary to that. I think FaZe will shock the world and, and they'll nick it two one crazy series. Uh just on the basis. I gotta keep saying that SK Gaming are a great team, but no great team can do it with uh somebody who knows they're not gonna be in at the end. So yeah, I, I I know Fallen thinks they can win this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say FaZe are gonna edge it. I think this will be a fucking insane series. So there you go. Uh, so there are my picks, there are my predictions. This was a slightly longer vlog. Obviously, there's more to go in. See the sun's shifting in the background. I gotta go do some media stuff, so I'm gonna love you and leave you. Uh, thanks a lot for taking the time to listen to this. I don't know if anyone gives a fuck, as I said, but you know I'll put them out for those that want to hear it. Uh, we get back to some normal content. Sam's here now. We're, we're getting set up. We're building our little mini studio. We're gonna start recording some shows and pumping that out after the major. So thanks for continuing to support the YouTube channel, supporting what I do, and of course supporting the major and E-League because we, we've been super happy with the way the community have engaged with us. And we're looking forward to more of that as we move forward. Anyway, take care, enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll see you at the Fox Theatre tomorrow.